So we're happy today to have Ilaria from Caltech. So Ilaria studied in, in Milan at the University of La Statale. And she, she got a PhD in Canada, University of British Columbia, and now she's a work fellow at the Caltech. Ilaria, Ilaria is interested in uh, cellular evolution and dynamics. She's studying black holes and neutron star in X-rays, white wars and brown wars. And uh, also she's a very accomplished and successful uh, producer. So if you can ask her more about that. <laughs> Uh, after the talk, and uh, today uh, Ilaria will tell us about uh, from Gaia to Lisa, white works at the center of the Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here telling all about white works. Uh, please interrupt. We have lots of slides. I, I can talk with a lot, uh, but I'm going to skip some of them and please interrupt me uh, with questions. And uh, let's make this very informal, please. And um, so, yes, I'm going to talk about my work about white words. I know, I know that a lot of people here don't think about white words very much. So, <laughs> I'll do a little bit of an uh, introduction. What are white words? Uh, they are the most common star focus. More than 95% of all stars become white words when they die. Uh, and, you know, white words, there's a lot of them. Uh, if you compare, for example, to neutron stars, you know, you know, for neutron stars for which we have an age and a temperature, uh, we have like a few, maybe a dozen, a few dozen of neutron stars. White dwarfs, we have thousands and thousands uh, of them. I've been studying them a lot. So a lot of people that don't think about white dwarfs uh, think we really know everything about them. And we know a lot about the typical white dwarf. Uh, so, you know, the mass is about half the mass of the sun. Uh, or compress in the radius that is similar to that of the Earth. And uh, white dwarfs are the remnant of, of the cores of stars, and so they're made mostly of uh, the ashes of nuclear burning, the mostly carbon and oxygen in the core. For a typical white dwarf, some of them can have just helium if they're very low mass, or they can go up to magnesium and oxygen. And the surface of the white dwarf is uh, the gravity is extremely high. And therefore, um, all of the heavy elements sink very quickly. And so on the surface, you usually have the lightest element present, uh, which usually is hydrogen. So that's the spectrum over there of a typical white dwarf. And those lines that you see are absorption lines of hydrogen. And so as I said, we know a lot about this type of white dwarfs. Uh, there are a lot of open questions about white dwarfs, and they all revolve around the atypical ones. And uh, very important implications for a lot of field of astrophysics. Uh, so one question, for example, is what is the maximum mass for a star to become a white dwarf? I told you, you know, most of stars, you know, more than 95% of stars become white dwarfs. And we know that it's all of the ones that have masses below about eight solar masses. But that limit is not very well known. It could be a little bit less, it could be 10. Uh, and this is very important because, uh, for example, if you're interested in the rate of productions of neutron stars or of the rate of core collapse supernovae in the galaxy, um, those are very sensitive to this limit. And we still don't know what exactly that is. Um, another part, another question that I'm very interested in is the origin of magnetic fields in white holes. We know that the large fraction of white dwarfs, about 20% of them, are magnetic. And they have like a huge range of field strengths from just a few kilogauss to um, a billion of gauss. So overlapping millisecond pulses, for example, um, in terms of field strengths. But we still don't know where this huge diversity comes from or why some of them are magnetic and why uh, some of them are not. And uh, I think that's a very important question because it, you know, if you really want to understand, if you want to understand the origin of magnetic fields in stars, uh, white dwarfs are a good place to look at. Uh, and then there's this huge new field of planets around white dwarfs. Uh, it's uh, really growing a lot because in the past uh, 10 years, we have discovered entire planets, partially disrupted planets, debris disks and rings uh, around white dwarfs. And uh, those are all very interesting systems because they tell us about what happens to a, a star system, a planetary system after uh, the star dies. Uh, another 
very uh, another part uh, about white doors that are very interested in is white doors in closed binaries. And I'm going to talk about these, of course, uh, uh, they can tell us a lot about uh, evolution of stars in binaries. And you know, with Lisa coming up, uh, we will detect lots of white doors in closed binaries. Uh, and finally, uh, of course, what are the progenitor of type of main supernova? Supernovae. We know that white doors are involved somehow, uh, but we still don't know, for example, what's the contribution of mergers versus accreting white doors, type of supernovae. So again, there's more open questions about white doors. I just wanted to advertise that white doors are very interesting for a lot of reasons. But other than that, uh, this is probably one of the best times to study white doors because there's been a lot of new uh, instruments and surveys that has been recently uh, started recently or that will come very soon. Uh, and each one of them has changed the way we study white doors. Of course, Gaia, the Gaia, uh, you know about Gaia, has been incredible for a lot of fields of astrophysics uh, and it's been amazing for white doors, and I'll show you why. And then another uh, is the high cadence time domain surveys like CTS, PTF, these are, uh, these are have opened the window on the dynamic skies and also variable white doors and binaries. And there's new spectroscopic surveys you might have heard of in Festival 5, DESI, Weave, uh, and of course, uh, GWST. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then in the near future, with them. Uh, and I'll start with Gaia. Uh, you know, Gaia has given us precise photometry and astrometry for billions of stars which has been great for a lot of reasons, but for white doors in particular, it's been amazing because before Gaia, to find a white dwarf, you had to point a telescope and take a spectrum. Uh, because white doors are blue fade objects, but unless you know the distance, it could be a white dwarf, it could be something else. And so you needed a spectroscopy to identify them. With Gaia, we have the distances to stars. And so you can just plot them in a nature diagram with an absolute magnitude, on the y-axis, and there they are in the lower left corner. That's how you find them. So all of a sudden, we went from this, I think about 30,000 white doors, mostly from this lone spectroscopic survey, uh, which was not designed to find white doors. It was designed to find galaxies. So most of white doors were the leftovers from this lone spectroscopic surveys, to having, uh, now we have um, half a million white doors uh, all over the sky, a much deeper, a much complete, a much less biased, way less biased sample. So this has really changed the way we study white doors. Now we started to do, uh, um, you know, uh, population studies. We started to count white doors. It's, it's been a really uh, a game changer. Um, and so, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're going to do with the. What, what project that I have just using Gaia, but as I was saying, like the, with the SDSS, the old SDSS, the Sloan survey was not defined to find white doors. Right now, there's, there's several spectroscopic surveys, SDSS, DESI, uh, WEAVE, Foremost, and they all have a targeted uh, program for white doors. But for all of the Gaia white doors, we will get spectra, <laughs> which is another, it's going to be another completely revolutionary thing for this, for our field. Uh, but yeah, let's talk a little bit about some science. Uh, so this is a project that uh, I've worked at UBC with my collaborators only using Gaia. And the project was to look for white doors in open clusters. Yeah, open clusters are great to study stars because, you know, these are this agglomerate of stars all born at about the same time and all at the same distance. Uh, and with Gaia, it's, it's quite incredible because these open clusters are huge in the sky, often if they're very close. Uh, and so, but now with Gaia, we have parallaxes and proper motions. And so we can find precise, um, confident cluster members because if you see if the cluster is moving in the sky, and it's a certain distance. If you see a star that is moving with the cluster, which is at the right distance, then it's a, pro it's, it's a cluster member. If it's going in the opposite direction as the cluster, even if it's right there, it's probably just the coincidence that it's there. Um, and so what it, why is this important for white dwarfs? Uh, because in clusters, you know the age of the cluster quite well. 
Here is an HR diagram of a few classes, like three different classes of three different ages. Uh, and you can see that, you know, if you look at the stars that are turning off the moon sequence, you can get a pretty good estimate of uh, the age of the cluster. In this one in black, uh, ACC 47 is an open cluster, and we could get a measurement of the age, which was a 90 million plus or minus five, just a pretty good estimate of the age. Uh, on the other hand, if you find a white dwarf in the cluster, it's like in this case, it was a white dwarf right there. Uh, if you find uh, a white dwarf, you can get the age of the white dwarf since it was born. You can you take a spectrum uh, and you see what, what its temperature is, what its mass, you can figure out, okay, what's the age of the white dwarf as a white dwarf? And so you subtract those two and you can figure out when the progenitors turned off the main sequence. So what was the progenitor mass of, uh, of this white dwarf? And this is exactly what we, were we, we, were, we did with Gaia. We looked for white dwarfs in clusters to get this initial final, to, to probe the higher mass end of the initial final mass relation. As you can see before Gaia, we didn't have that many white dwarfs. Now we are really probing the initial final, when I'm saying it's the initial mass, of the progenitor stars and final mass of the white dwarf. Uh, and so, as I said, we are really getting to probe that high mass end of initial final mass relation, which is very interesting also because it tells us about mass loss at the end of the star's life. And also we are starting to probe that limit of what is the maximum mass for a star to become uh, a white dwarf. Why the tendency for the Previous measurements to see the low mass end of the omega uh, It's because, um, I mean, it's because low, uh, high mass white dwarfs are rare. And so uh, it was very, and they're much fainter, and because they're much smaller. And so it just, it, they're just harder to find. With Gaia, we could probe a much bigger uh, sample of, uh, of classes than before. And so actually, these are not, these are the previous no white dwarf that we could reconfirm in Gaia. I mean, this goes down a lot. Of course, I was just, I'm just showing the, the higher mass end. Uh, there's way more. We were just interested in above two solar masses, in each other, but there's way more to uh, But this is just to show that over there, yeah, in that, in that range, it was very rare. But the other reason why uh, it's harder to find them, it's because they escape. Oh, open clusters are very, uh, not very bound. And so if you think about it, the progenitor of a white dwarf that is 1.1 or 1.1 or 1.3 solar masses is around six or eight. So you have maybe, you know, five solar mass lost in winds at the end of its life. Uh, and even if you have a little bit of asymmetry in this mass loss, you will get a kick. Uh, and, and to get out of an open cluster, one kilometer per second is enough, which is very small. So it's, 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 very, uh, it's very easy for high mass fibers to escape from plastic. And that's exactly another thing that we can look for with Gaia. We can look at the cluster uh, and look at volume around the cluster uh, that bring them back both in time, you know, stars in the volume around the cluster and the cluster and see and look for escapers. Because with Gaia, we also have proper motions. So this is actually something that we are working on right now, which is catching the escapers from open clusters. So here I'm showing, for example, the HR diagram of this Alpha Percy, uh, an open cluster nearby. And you can see that we, we, can, we could recover um, these HR diagrams of stars as they escape between 0 and 25 millimeters ago, 25 to 50, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that we could recover, of course, there were some interlopers, but we can recover uh, escapers. And this is actually what we're trying to do to see if there are massive white dwarfs around open clusters. Uh, for example, in this case, for Alpha Perk, we recover a couple. Of course, this one in the middle down here, they are like interlopers. Uh, they're too old to be part of the cluster. But we were able to uh, recover some of the white dwarfs. Uh, and actually, this is a project that uh, I'm doing uh, with Dave Miller, who's a, a graduate student at UBC. Uh, he analyzed the Hyvis cluster, which is this 
cluster, very famous, very close to, uh, to Earth. Uh, and he was able to find uh, uh, four ultramassive white dwarfs that escaped the cluster recently. Uh, and among them, he found the most uh, massive uh, white dwarf that we know uh, came from a project single progenitor star. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you can see, it's actually a very good measurement of the mass and it's about like 1.35 solar masses, uh, which is very interesting because the first direct observation that single star produce white dwarfs all the way up to the Chandrasekhar limit, which is not obvious, you know, it could maybe stop at a certain point, go for a collapse. Uh, instead, this one is uh, highly likely that it comes from a single progenitor star and it's all the way very close to the Chandrasekhar mass. In terms of globular clusters, people seem to think there's a problem that the clusters are evaporating too rapidly, too efficiently. Mm -hmm. you, that's something you would now measure with open clusters. Is there a similar problem? We haven't looked, I mean, we, for now, we, just, we were just looking at white dwarfs. Uh, we haven't looked into like the dynamics of open clusters, and, but it, that's something that definitely you can do. You see all of the escapers. And if you get a good sense of your completeness, you can try and compare to predictions, which is something we haven't done yet, but it's definitely something that we want to do. Uh, to study the history of evacuation of open clusters. Um, okay, so this was something that, as you can see, it was just able only thanks to Gaia. Uh, um, I'm gonna skip these. There's other projects just using Gaia, but <laughs> as I said, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to bore you too much. I, just, I want to move on to another facility that everyone is thinking about right now. Uh, and we might think that it's not the greatest facility for white doors because white doors are blue. Why do you need an GWC for white doors? Uh, but that's because um, what GWC is great to look for planets around stars. Uh, it's also good to look, to look at uh, planets around white doors. And I have, uh, and actually, Xiao is not here, Xiao Cheng, but he has a project to look for planets around white dwarfs that we are collaborating with, which I'm not going to talk about because you can talk with him about it. Uh, I'm just going to tell you one other project that I'm working on um, with JWC, which is uh, finding the first planetary systems, and it's about globular clusters. Uh, so the idea is that, um, you know, we we don't know exactly when the galaxy first started forming planets and planetary systems. Is there a threshold in metallicity? Is there a threshold uh, in age? When did it start? Uh, and the way to look at this is to look in globular clusters because those are the oldest uh, populations in our, uh, in our galaxy. Uh, however, um, there's been some, some tries of looking for transients in globular clusters, uh, but I think there's still we should still try to look for transient in globular clusters. I think that that project is not conclusive. Uh, but another way to look for them is to look not at planets, but at planetary systems and around white dwarfs. And the idea is to look for white dwarfs with the blue disks. Because in the field, outside, we have found lots of white dwarfs with an infrared excess that shows that there is a debris disks around them. And these debris disks are formed by falling planetary material. It could be asteroids, comets, some planetary stuff that is falling onto the white dwarf and creating these debris disks. Many more white dwarfs are observed to be polluted, which means that we don't see a disk, but we see metals on, in the atmosphere, which also is caused by this infolding planetary material. Um, but, but the idea is that if they are there in the field, then maybe they're there in the global class too. Uh, and if we can see them, then we can kind of like see the first planetary systems in the, in the galaxy. Uh, and see that, so this is the estimate of a white dwarf, a famous white dwarf with the infrared excess. So this is the uh, SED of the white dwarf, and that's the infrared excess uh, to the disk. And so the idea is that we, uh, we take a globular cluster where we know where all the white doors are because globular clusters have been studied very well in the optical and the UV. And then we look in the infrared and see if any of them have infrared excesses. Uh, and this is exactly uh, what uh, we propose for GWST. We took a field uh, outside the center of 47 Tucanian, 
several reasons that I can explain if you're interested. Uh, one of the reasons is because this is the deepest HST field on the, uh, on the global addresses. So there was 121 orbits just staring at this one field with HST. So we know where all of the writers are. Uh, and over there is uh, the proposed observation with GWC. We're still actually, we got three orbits. The third, the fourth one was observed yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, it, because it was a problem, and so it was delayed, or blah, but the, the first one, so I don't have the results yet because we're still working on it, but I can show you how amazing it is. So this is a, a, a linking between HST and GWST. Uh, the, the GWST is the spiky one. And uh, you can see this, we're talking about 100 hours, 120 hours of HST versus five hours of GWC. Uh, and you can see that GWC is already going deeper. It's really amazing. But of course, it's also red there. So you can see, for example, galaxies popping up uh, here and here, for example. But you can also see stars. We have a very stupid one. What is the bar, what, uh, the, the scale on? on uh, I don't remember what's the scale, but this, this was also not fully calibrated. This is just to show you, yeah, you're right. This is not a fair comparison because it's still not completely calibrated, but you can see stars popping out and things like that. So I, I, I will have a much better view soon when we're finished analyzing the data. It's, it's complicated also because you have uh, these huge spikes that go all over. So doing precision photometry with this data, it's quite crowded. Uh, it's not it's not obvious. <laughs> That's what we want to do. Uh, and the idea is to find um, to look at all of the white doors. That's actually gonna be quite the easier part, just taking all of the white doors and see for infrared excesses. We might already have found one, we have to confirm it. Uh, and then we have once we have them, we have we're gonna ask for spectroscopy to confirm if they're actually the previous. Uh, yeah, yes. Don't we expect like this to be resolved with dynamical friction or something? Sorry? Nice question. Like the disks, like due to dynamical friction. Uh... You mean because it's in a globular? Yeah. yeah. So first of all, this is the outskirts. It's not in the center. Uh, these disks are extremely small. We're talking about the solar radius. So uh, like it's the it's the size of the disk. So it's not the disk. It would it's, it's, they're not very. I don't think they're they're not very long lived. We get uh, distracted very easily, but we see around 5% in the star, around in this like range of temperatures of white doors, we see about 5% in the field uh, that have disks. Uh, and so we would expect if, to see a few at least here, if it's the same, um, the same range, the same as the, as the field. If you don't find any, uh, then it could mean that either there aren't because of metallicity or because, or because of, uh, uh, there may be planets, planetary systems just to not form because in this very, uh, um, this very uh, compact and dynamic environment. However, we, we're pretty far away from the center of the cluster. So I don't think dynamics should be a problem. Um, and then yeah, the other reason why we went so far away from the center is because the other science case for this project was brown dwarfs, just to find the, the to, look, to look at brown dwarfs in a globular cluster uh, for the first time. So we've never seen brown doors in the globular cluster. And so as you can see, this is, this is actually the HST observation. You see they go very deep, 30th magnitude in 606. We got to the end of the main sequence, but, but that's it. You know, you never got to the brown door sequence. And so the idea is simulated because I don't got to the data yet, but the idea is to try and go further down and study the brown door. I'm gonna not talk very much about this uh, because I'm here to talk about white doors. Uh, okay, next to the next uh, uh, facility, and I have a DWC, and one a very exciting I and mean, is a, a big part of my research is a uh, photometric surveys. Zuki Transit Facility is one of them. Uh, it's uh, led by Caltech. Uh, it's run at Palomar on the 48-inch telescope over there. But a small telescope, which has done uh, a lot of amazing things because the Zwicky Transit Facility, what it does is just a stare. Uh, it takes images of the northern sky uh, with a very huge field of view. Uh, as you can see here, it's 47, uh, 47 square degree. 
is compared to the moon or to the Andromeda galaxy that is very large from the view, which means that ZTF can take images of the entire northern sky every two days. Uh, and so this has been great to find things that go off, like supernovae, TDs, transients. Uh, but it's also been amazing to find stars that change in luminosity with time, like this one that I'm showing down here. This was found with ZTF. This is a binary of two white dwarfs that uh, orbit each other every seven minutes. And then it's a light curve uh, going up and down every seven minutes. Uh, and of course, ZTF is not sampling that finely, sampling every couple of days, but you can, with enough epochs, you can just fold all of this data and look for periodic objects like that one. Uh, and of course, uh, my, my collaborator, Kevin Burge, who is now at MIT, uh, developed all the machinery to sieve through this data and find um, viable stars, in particular viable white dwarfs. Uh, and the part that I'm most interested in is white dwarfs that are at the end point of the evolution in binaries, so that are the results of the merger of two white dwarfs. As you know, you know white dwarfs are compact objects. Uh, if you have two white dwarfs that are close enough, they emit gravitational waves, uh, and uh, the orbits shrink until they merge. And this actually is going to be a big part of the science for LISA, because as soon as LISA comes out, it's going to see the entire population of close binary white dwarfs in the galaxy. Uh, but once they merge, of course, if they're massive enough, then they explode in a type 1 supernova. And that's something that, of course, ETF is finding all the time. So it's what finding a supernova pretty common. That's about 75% of all supernova. And the ZTF looks at. Uh, but the other outcome, if the mass is low enough, is that the two white dwarfs merge and create another white dwarf. And we can find this too, because uh, we expect the, uh, the white dwarf remnant. Of course, what's, what are the characteristics? It's going to be, you know, they're usually more massive than average because they're two white dwarfs. But, and of course, they're, they're rapidly rotating because some of the angular momentum of the binary is conserved in the final white dwarf. And we expect them also to be highly magnetized because of the strong dynamos that arise during the mergers. And so if you have something that is magnetized and rotating, it's, it's very likely that it's going to be variable because the magnetic field is going to change and make, it, make the emission from the surface not uniform. As you can see here, and then as the star rotates, maybe there's a hot spot that you can see coming in and out of the line of sight. And so we can find these ones with ZTF. And that's exactly what I've been working on. I've been focusing mostly on the massive. So this is the HL diagram for white dwarfs. Uh, this down here, there's the more massive white dwarfs. So I've been focusing mostly on those ones because that's where we expect to find the most of them. And then I've looked for periodicity in ZTF. And then I took spectra to figure out if they were magnetic or not. Um, okay. I, I, can, I, I think most of you are curious. I don't know how interested are, are you in like, how do we figure out their magnetic? Maybe you can ask me later. I'm going to skip this. But from the spectrum, we can figure out if the writers are magnetic. And so we started looking for these objects. And so the, this was the very first one that we found. Uh, it was very interesting because it was this one white dwarf was so blue, sort of the bluest object in Gaia, which means it was very massive and hot. But also it was varying in luminosity every seven minutes. So white dwarfs rotate usually with periods of about an hour to a day, between a few hours to a day or a few days. Seven minutes is very rare for a white dwarf. It's very fast. It's very hard to create something like that from the evolution of a single star. Uh, because you, you usually couple the core with the, with, the, with the envelope. It's very hard to get to this, this velocity. So it was a very good candidate for a merger. And so we took a spectrum and we realized that this object was indeed highly magnetized, very magnetized, 800 megagauss. Uh, it's Extremely high. It's one of the mostly magnetized white dwarfs known. 
And so this is the perfect kind of poster child for a merger. Also, we uh, went on and take a UV spectroscopy, uh, sorry, photometry to figure out the mass and the radius of these objects. Uh, and we realized that it was also extremely small. I told you that white dwarfs are usually the size of the Earth, around you know, 7,000 kilometers radius. This one was 2,000 kilometers, more like the size of the moon. Uh, and so white dwarfs, the smaller they are, the more massive they are. And so this one was an incredibly massive uh, white dwarf. So about very, very close to the Chandrasekhar mass. Uh, so for example, here you can see the mass radius relation at different compositions. Uh, and so this is about the radius of our white dwarf, around 2,000 kilometers. And it's quite, what's quite interesting for this object is that the center of the white dwarf is so dense that it's above the threshold for density for electron capture uh, on uh, sodium. And so, um, you know, typical to like progenitor of neutron stars is some electron capturing going on inside this white dwarf right now, which is very interesting because it's a white dwarf that is cooling through Urca processes mostly, uh, which is quite strange for a white dwarf. Uh, but also because electrons are what give uh, the pressure needed for the stars to, to survive versus the self gravity. Right? Electron degeneracy pressure is what keeps up a white dwarf. So if you're removing electrons, it means that the radius would shrink because you need more pressure to keep up the white dwarf. And so, I mean, right now this is stable because there's not enough sodium in the core. Uh, to destabilize, to capture enough electrons. However, in white dwarfs, heavy elements sink towards the center. This one is a, a young white dwarf, so it's all mixed. But in time, elements sink to the center, and so more and more sodium will get into the center of this white dwarf, and so more and more electron captures will, will be going on until uh, you know, it could be enough uh, that you reach the, the threshold for double electron capture on magnesium. And then in that case, uh, it starts getting, it's got getting dancing for the poor white dwarf, uh, and it might collapse in the future. Over what time scale? And Hundreds of millions. That's the time scale for seeing. <laughs> so, that, so for this particular one, I mean, for this particular one, we, the problem is that it might freeze before that. You know, because the core of white dwarfs crystallize with time, especially because this one is cooling through Urca emission, which means that it's cooling faster. Uh, and so if I had to bet, I would say that at a certain point it would crystallize. And when it crystallizes, there's no more sinking. The, the, the sodium doesn't sink anymore, and then it's going to be fine. Uh, so for this particular one, I, I, I would say that if we, haven't, we don't have that many studies of such massive and dense white dwarfs because we didn't know they were out there before. So there's been a lot of like new studies uh, since, since this paper to look at like what could look like at the evolution of a white dwarf at these um, at these crazy masses and with work up pulling inside, etc. But those are the time scales, both for sinking and for crystallization. We're talking about hundreds of millions of years. So we have to see, you know, the everyone has to see which one wins first. Um, so for this white dwarf, do you see anything interesting in terms of its uh, galactic orbit? So, for example, if this, do we expect any like strong kick? If this, uh, not from the merger, not from the merger, no. Uh, well, you you would expect some. So one one thing I'm gonna briefly mention this later, but one thing that we do expect is that you know mergers have some delay that comes from the evolution of the binary, right? So if you have a white dwarf. At a certain mass, that is a normal white dwarf single star. You know, the time scale for like its lifetime is going to be the lifetime of the progenitor plus the lifetime of it as a white dwarf. In this case, you have the lifetime of it as a white dwarf plus time scale of the progenitor plus the, the, the binary lifetime, right? Uh, and so you do expect white dwarfs that are merger remnants to move on average and faster because older objects in the galaxy move faster because they, they get heated up by interactions with the, with the galactic potential, et cetera. So on average, you expect the sample of merger remnants to be faster than white dwarfs that look the same age 
um, that's something something that we want to, that I want that I want to take the sample and try to figure out. Uh, so you can constrain, for example, the delay time for mergers, and so maybe the time. And that's a lot of there's a lot of implication. For example, what's the typical? All of these come from common envelope resolution, and so what's the typical? Uh, uh, separation after common envelope evolution that's a lot of implication on like the delay time right and so this is something that we can constrain with these objects so um, can we see that time delay from this uh, like uh, magnetized you, should, you shouldn't do one with one it's not very significant you have to see it as a population you just have to compare your population because of course one you can have like you know that was moving faster for any other reason uh but you, also because you don't have the radial velocities for these objects you have only the 2d velocities in the sky. Um, so, but yeah, this is something that I'm working on. I, I'm, for, for what I can see, there's not a huge delay in my sample of mergers. So these are probably coming from a very rapid binary evolution, but I don't want to say, <laughs> I don't want to say until I finish all the analysis. But yes, in general, you expect them to move faster than when you're at a similar age. Yeah. Why do the curves go down? Oh, right. So, this is just because it's this is um, in GR. This was calculated in GR at a certain point. You know, if you if you um, at a certain point uh, it becomes so compact uh, that um, this is the GR effect. It just it, GR contributes, you know, pressure contributes to gravity, and then it just uh, it just cannot go. This for this one in particular is because I included the effect of electron capture. So it's like if if you're assuming that. Uh, you're just calculating all of the sodium or all of the magnesium that is within a certain uh, below the threshold as on uh, electron capture. Then this is the mass radius relation. Of course, uh, as, this, as as you get more and more electrons, you just keep going down. Uh, and this is electron capture on uh, sodium, magnesium, and neon. After neon, it's done. <laughs> if you reach uh, electron capture on neon, there's so much neon that uh, we would uh, just collapse. Uh, but if it does collapse, then it could either become, you know, explode in a type 1 supernova or become a neutron star. You know, I don't know if you've heard, you know, some, some, for example, in globular cluster, we see young pulses, and people think that it comes from white doors that have collapsed through accretion. Uh, and this is, would be a similar thing. If, if it does collapse, uh, if, you know, depending on the dynamics of uh, oxygen burning, it can, if it's like very fast and explosive, it would explode in type 1A. Otherwise, it can just slowly burn and collapse into a neutron star. We see, we're still not 100% sure which, which way it would go. Um, and this is all very speculative, as I said. Uh, this is not, I don't think this particular one will collapse. But if, you know, it's interesting because this object is only 40 parsec away. It's very close. So these objects are pretty common uh, in, in the galaxy. Okay, and so as I was saying, now this was just the first one. Now we have about 70 candidates that span a big range of magnetic fields, of periods. Uh, of course, the masses are all pretty high because that's where I look, but this, this, we should also look at lower masses because there are ways to, to have mergers at much lower masses too. Um, and so this is a very good sample, as I said, because on one way you have to constrain the pathways in these mergers, for example, uh, the uh, the merger delay, the type of mergers, the type of progenitors. Uh, these are, this is also great for studying magnetic white doors because for these ones, they rotate. So you can get spectra as the white dwarf rotate. And so we can uh, see how the white dwarf, the magnetic field changes on the surface of the white dwarf. Because as you can see, you take all the spectra, um, you can just do the topology of the magnetic field on the surface of the white dwarf. So this is an incredible sample to study magnetic fields on white dwarfs. And of course, uh, the, the goal now that I'm working very hard on is trying to understand what's the completeness of my sample to see how many I'm missing. You know, it depends on um, you know, what kind of amplitudes in the luminosity of the oscillation of the uh, variability. Uh, it depends on the luminosity of the, of the star itself. So I'm, now I'm trying to constrain the completeness of my sample to see how many there actually are in the galaxy of these type of objects, and, and so get a, a merger rate, uh, a double wide of merger rate from this sample. This is a working process. 
Um, so about this sample, so uh, you you still need to confirm them by a spectroscopy survey to see the sieve demand splitting. Is that the way you did? Uh, so so for the sieve they're magnetic? And how about for weekly magnetized white rock, which is only identifiable by uh, like spectropolarity? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, that's a good point. I I did follow them all up with CAC, uh, and they all turned out to be quite highly magnetized. Uh, all, of, all of the ones that I found in that region of the HR diagram, so among the massive white doors, all of the roughly rotating white doors that I followed up, they were all highly magnetized. And by highly, I mean more than a few megagauss. So they go from a few megagauss all the way to hundreds uh, or a gigagauss. The highest one was 550 megagauss. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I was also, I, I am, I'm starting to do spectropolarimetry because CAC was broken, the spectropolarimetry was broken, but they finally fixed it at my first night a few, uh, a few weeks ago, then it broke again, but they should fix it again. So I will do spectropolarimetry, but for now it wasn't needed because all of them, it turned out, I think it is a correlation. Of course, there might, there might be, lower magnetic ones, because they probably don't show this variability. So I'm selecting that true variability. So of course, there is the question on like, so the mergers. So the, the most important clue is the rapid rotation, because I think you can have magnetic waders. I, I, think, I do think some magnetic waders come from evolution and not from mergers. Uh, and there's more and more hints that there's definitely this double way of creating magnetic waders. So, it's not just the magnetic, what, the magnetism that is telling you that they're merging. It's mostly the, the rotation, uh, and so there, there could be the, the, the problem is like, what if magnetic, what, you know, mergers make also very low magnetic field white doors, and I'm not finding them because maybe they're rotating, but uh, the variability is not high enough because of the magnetic field. But that, that's something that you know I can also consider, like how far how far down am I going? In magnetic field uh, or an amplitude of variation. Another thing that I'm planning to do is using TESS. So TESS is in space. Um, and so it's much better to detect very small amplitude variation. It can only go to, you know, observe only uh, bright stars, go down to maybe 17, 18 magnitude maximum, but they can look for, for tiny variation. So that's another one that I can use. A magnitude limited sample to see how many I'm missing at the low amplitude end. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm not showing, I'm not saying, oh, the rate is this, <laughs> because it's not, it's not obvious. Uh, but I think there is a lot of information in there. It's just we have to be very, have to be very careful in characterizing the sample and the end and selection like that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for now I'll just talk about the, the very end of the double. White dwarf, uh, like the evolution in binaries, uh, the single white dwarf coming out of a, of a merger. Uh, but stars are variable, stars in binaries are variable throughout the, um, their lives because you have, you know, double main sequence binaries, you can find eclipsing one, you can find, you can find stars, variable stars in, at every step of these. And in fact, uh, this is, these are example of light curves with ZTF only, and only from the ZTF variable stars group at Caltech. Uh, so, and we have found objects in all of these, um, these step. And so I think what's gonna be, is what's gonna come next is, you know, for now we've been mostly focusing on single objects that are very interesting, like this, Magnetized white dwarf. My friend Kevin has been looking at all of these very weird binaries. Uh, Karim has been looking, so everyone has been looking at very specific objects that are interesting. But the next step would be to split populations, the same as I'm doing with the, with the white dwarf merger remnants. We can do the same with the MCBNs and CBs and white dwarf plus main sequence binaries. My friend Jan van Rostel is working on. A huge sample of white dwarf plasmin sequence, there's thousands of them, and he's trying to figure out what's the completeness and the selection effects. So I think the next step will go to find populations about all of the different steps and connect the dots between them. So we can move from this cartoon image to a real understanding of the evolution of, of uh, stars in closed binaries. And uh, so yeah, these are like all of these, we found all of these very interesting objects. Uh, but again, the next step would be uh, 
uh, to uh, build population of them. And this is, as I said, this is a great time because there's not only ZPF, there's lots of other time domain surveys coming up. And I'm sure you've heard about the Rubin Observatory uh, that is uh, starting to give us data in uh, about a year. Uh, and of course, uh, Tess and Gaia is going to give us light curves for objects too in 2025. Um, and then, of course, there's this, this spectroscopic surveys. Because for now, I had to look at every one of them with Keck or Palma of my white dwarfs to get spectra. But with these surveys, we will have spectra as all of the white dwarfs in Gaia. So you can just put together and all of the stuff that is between the white dwarf and the main sequence, which is where all the binaries live. So we can just put together the photometric variability, the spectroscopy. It's going to be very easy to put together samples of objects. So I'm just saying that I think this is the beginning. When Lisa comes up in you know, 10 years, we will have already understood a lot about the evolution of white dwarfs in binaries. And Lisa will just give us a new window uh, on, the, on the very last stages. Um, so in terms of picture, like, please be interested in binaries and white dwarfs. Uh, I still have 10 minutes, I'm gonna just briefly talk about this one white dwarf that I found, uh, kind of sitting deep with uh, Also because when you start looking at viability, when you start looking at things that change in the sky, uh, you start finding a lot of strange objects. So I found so many in my sample of like very strange objects, and this is one of them. Uh, this is a, a white dwarf. As you can see, this is again this nature diagram for white dwarfs. It's a pretty massive one. Uh, that's the light curve in different filters from bluer to redder. 15 minutes period, pretty sinusoidal. It looked like a typical object in my sample. And then I took a spectrum and it doesn't look at all like the others. So I don't know if you can see it very well, but so these are absorption lines that I indicated as red for helium and blue for hydrogen. Uh, so for example, this one is hydrogen, hydrogen, this one is helium, helium, etc. Uh, so this is a mix hydrogen and helium atmosphere white dwarf. That's not particularly uncommon. We know a lot of them. The spectrum looks weird if you're used to uh, staring at white dwarf spectra, as I do, but not particularly. However, this is a spectrum taken over several periods, so it's a long exposure spectrum. Uh, but I, I decided to go with CAC and try to see if there was any viability in the spectrum over the 15 minutes period. So I took different spectra at different rotation phases. Uh, and this is what it looked like. Uh, if you look at one phase up here, for example, if you look at all of the blue lines, they're all there and they're quite strong. These are all the hydrogen absorption lines, while the helium lines, like this one, for example, they're not there at all. And then if you go to the opposite phase, so rotate, by 180 degrees, the white dwarf, all of the blue line, the blue heat, the absorption lines of hydrogen, they're gone. And there's only helium absorption lines. So this is a double-faced white dwarf. On one side, it's only hydrogen, and on the other side, it's only helium. And it's very, it's, it's, it's really amazing because, I mean, it's, it's so clear cut. Uh, I took so much spectrum and spectrum of these objects, I wasn't believing it. Uh, but it's absolutely like this. It's, it's a double phase white dwarf. Um, and uh, lines are just like arbitrarily offset, right? On the, on the y axis? Yes, yes, yes. This is just uh, uh, yeah. It, the, the, the spectrum changes a little bit in, um, in shape. It goes a little bit like this. That's where the 15 minutes variability comes from. Uh, it gets bluer and, and redder, uh, but just a little bit. And um, no, the most the most striking rest is the most the same. The most striking thing is that the lines appear and disappear every every 15 minutes. And I came back after a year and it was still the same. Uh, it's just very stable, both in photometry and in spectroscopy. So I called it Janus, like the double face god, the Roman uh, god of uh, transition. Uh, which I think it was it's a it could be a very good name because this could be. Uh, a transitioning white dwarf. 
uh, and we might have caught it as it is transitioning from having a fully hydrogen atmosphere to a fully helium atmosphere. Because we know, so if you look at again this data diagram, uh, if you go down, um, these are like young white dwarf, old white dwarf cooling down. And so there is a certain range in temperatures between, between 30,000 and 50,000 degrees where we see very few helium white dwarfs, almost none. Um, they're all hydrogen. And the reason why we think that's the case is because even if you have a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of hydrogen, it will float and it will cover the entire surface, like an ocean on a mountainous planet. And you need very, very little um, amount of hydrogen. You're talking 10 to the minus 15 or 10 to the minus 16, so there are masses of hydrogen. And so most of weathers have at least that amount of hydrogen, which then floats up and covers the entire surface. It takes some time for it to float up, but then in this range, they look like normal hydrogen white dwarfs. But then at around 30,000 degrees, there's the helium underneath where it starts becoming very convective. And therefore it breaks into the thin layer of hydrogen. And since there's so much more helium than hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen completely gets diluted, it completely disappears, and then you see that they're helium. So there, you have this transition that happens at around uh, the, the temperature for convection to start completing. And that's why people thought, that's why some of them have enough hydrogen that that doesn't happen, but some of them have little hydrogen to become helium, and that's the transition that we see here. And that's exactly what John sees. Yes. Is there any intuitive way for me to think about why it would be distributed like this, where it would happen more in one half than the other, as opposed to having it be more spread out? And like you need something. Mm. It cannot just be. It cannot just be the convection because you would. Have, the, the, it's actually because hydrogen floats. If you have hydrogen only on one side, we just it, 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 you cannot just have it only on one side. It just the dynamics and time scales for the hydrogen to, to be diffused, it's very, it's not, it's not like molecular diffusion. It's like if you have a, a glass of water, you cannot just stay, it just, it will, it will um, if you put a mountain of water, right, it will just spread immediately. Um, so it's not, it, you have to need something. This is a gaseous thing. So the only thing that we can think of is magnetic field. If you have some magnetic field, magnetic field can inhibit convection. And so if the magnetic field is stronger from on one side and on the other, uh, it could be enough to inhibit convection on one side, and so you still see the hydrogen. Well, on the other side, the convection has already disrupted um, the hydrogen layer, and you see the helium. So that could be one explanation. Um, again, we, we don't see magnetic field in this one, which is kind of, if, if magnetic field was too strong, you probably have inhibited, you, you would inhibit convection of the entire surface, right? So it, maybe it makes sense when you don't see magnetic field. Uh, you need it to be pretty low. Otherwise, you need a huge difference in field between the two, two phases. Uh, the, the, the next step, you know, I, don't, I cannot take spectrophotometry of this guy because it's so faint, but I found another couple of objects like this. One of them is brighter. And, and so the, the goal is to, is the plan is to get spectrophotometry of that one to see if it's magnetic. Um, but also, I found actually this is the object that Siao is working on. I'm not sure if this is of the same class. Siao found it completely separately because he was looking for white dwarfs with infrared excesses to looking for planets. Uh, Siao is looking for like Jupiter planet, hot Jupiters around white dwarfs. Uh, and he found that this particular white dwarf had this different excess around 4.5 micron in infrared. Uh, so here is the density of a normal white dwarf, and this is the density of a white dwarf if you add a Jupiter, a hot Jupiter there. And he found that it was infrared excess. Um, but you know, you, you need you need spectroscopy to figure this out. It could also be just cycling emission because this white dwarf is magnetic. Uh, I only shown you like what magnetic field, what it does is that if you have one line, this is a hydrogen H alpha absorption line, instead of one, you have three. There's a Zeeman splitting, there's Zeeman splitting going on, you know, you have the uh, electrons in the, around the atom, you know, to go from N equal two to N equal three. Uh, it's not the generator anymore with the magnetic field. You can have delta N plus one or minus one or zero, and that's where the splitting in three happens. 
Uh, and so in this one, this is again divided by rotational phase. We have hydrogen and helium on one side, uh, and they're splitted about eight megagauss. On the other side, the helium disappears, and the hydrogen becomes one. So the magnetic is lower and goes down to less than one megagauss. Is it the same type of optic? Maybe. You know, Jonas is very special because geometrically we must see, you know, the hydrogen and the helium to be quite aligned with their line of sight. We don't expect to find, you know, even if, if you take Janus and you rotate it a little bit, in some cases you would not see both of elements disappear on both sides, right? That's, I think that geometry of Janus is particular. Maybe this one is similar, but it's a different geometry. That's why hydrogen never disappears. Uh, but then we have this magnetic field strength. This is, um, is this the same class or not? Not sure, maybe. <laughs> but this one is magnetized. So maybe Janus is magnetized too. And mm -hmm. that's the reason for the... Is the orientation of the magnetic field consistent with the rotation axis for Janus? I mean... But for Janus, we don't uh, see yeah, the uh, magnetic field. Right, right. But in order to sustain these two uh, hemispheres... You would, you, would have to, you would have to have the magnetic field. For example, an offset dipole would work with... You know, it doesn't have to be exactly 90 sure. degrees with the rotation axis because, you know, it could be, you have some limb darkening. So you, you could have like just a, a spot of hydrogen, for example, which is not exactly like this. It could be higher, it could be lower. So it doesn't have to be exactly 90 degrees, but it has to be, you know, yeah. maybe about 80 degrees or between, between the rotation axis and the magnetic field axis. Do you have an estimate for what's the duration which it will spend in this uh, transition? Uh, yeah, but it depends. The strength of the magnetic field, which we don't know what it is, uh, but we, again, we're talking about maybe uh, a few tens, maybe 100 million years. Depend, it depends, it's interplay between convection and, and the magnetic field. It's like, how long does it take, will it take for the convection to overcome the magnetic field on the strong side? Right? And that depends on the strength of the magnetic field. Uh, but it will, what will happen is that it will just become a helium white dwarf to a certain point the convection wins because it becomes stronger and stronger as the white dwarf cools down. So. Yeah, uh, I think I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Daria. And are there other questions? We are... yes. yeah. So uh, about the uh, uh, white dwarf escaper, so can you say something about their kick? Because probably that's very sensitive to the very tiny kick. And also related to this question is, do you try to measure the gravitational ratio of this white dwarf? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. The velocity of the cluster. Let me show. So um, one thing is that when we're looking to escape this, we're trying to be very conservative. So we may make a limit on the maximum kick, you know, of maximum velocity compared to that of the cluster of two kilometers. So, because otherwise you start getting more and more interlopers. So we are not gonna, if the, if the kicks are higher, with this method that we are using to find them, we're not gonna find them. So these ones are all less than two kilometers per second that we are finding. Um, for this one, and, and, and it's nice that you asked for a gravitational redshift because for this one, for example, this was a very hot massive what we found from the Hyades. Uh, we got the mass and radius in two different ways. One is from the SED. You just take the, you know, the spectral energy distribution, you fit it with models, and you see you get a radius. The other one is by fitting the absorption lines of hydrogen that gives you a surface gravity and the temperature. Uh, you can see here, so the Balmer lines are fitted with models. And on top of that, you can get a redshift. You can see these are all redshifted, but you, know, uh, you can see, already see the redshift here in this, and it's hard because uh, you're far away, but there is some redshift that we've, we also got. And if you assume that the radial velocity is what you need to get back into the cluster, it also agrees with the other. So these are the three measurements, redshift, uh, radius from SCD, and log G from, from lines. And they all agree very nicely. There is actually um, you know, one of the white dwarfs, one of the massive white dwarfs for which we have the best mass measurements. All of the other, for some reason, uh, all of the ultra massive white dwarfs around these masses that we have, most of them are highly magnetized because, you know, as you go to 1.3 solar masses, the, the single cell progenitors they become rare and rare, while you get more and more mergers. And so you, at around 1.3 solar masses, you get 
a huge, you know, maybe 60% of mergers. So it's very, it's, it's sort of all highly monetized. Uh, so this one is actually the, the most massive by for which we have a very good measurement of the mass from these three different methods. Yes, yes. Um, so can you go back to your last slide that you showed us? Mm -hmm. um, this might be a silly question because you might have already answered this, but I just missed it and I just want to make sure I understand. Um, you have here your first bullet point, the, the magnetic field variable. And I just wanted to understand whether you were able to learn anything about the variability you see in the magnetic field in terms of, can you argue that it's more magnetic um, on, on one side and does it match with what you're seeing in the actual, you know, helium versus hydrogen <laughs> abundance? And maybe, yeah. and if you said this, I do apologize. No, no, I didn't. Okay. Um, so now we can see, so the strength, the, so how separated these lines are from each other, so this is the Siemens split, right? So you have uh, the, the levels, the, the, the jersey gets lifted between the levels and how the higher the magnetic field, the larger the separation between the three components. So we can get um, an, a, a strength of the magnetic field from that, which is, is about eight mega gauss on, the, on, on this side. On this other side, I don't see the other two components at all, which could be two different things. It could be that we are looking at a, at a, at a part of the face of the star where the magnetic field changes very quickly. And so the two components on the side gets washed out or because the magnetic field has actually gone down to less than a mega gauss, because this then if you go down, these get closer and closer until you can really see them very well. Uh, you need high resolution spectroscopy, but also for wide words, you just can't because the lines are so broad. Um, and so the, this, this could be, so it could be still lower or higher than eight mega gauss. So the, the, the matter, will, I will get spectral polarity of this because spectral polarity then can tell you what is the case for this phase. Uh, so the fact that the lower line also doesn't have the, the little, um, sorry, the, the lower spectrum doesn't have the line that you're highlighting that's around like 500. Yeah, this one is helium and this one is hydrogen. Yeah. Okay, so the fact that it seems like it's consistent with your model is, is the point I'm trying to make, right? Like it all seems like it's actually really pretty good evidence. For uh, actually, this is the opposite of what we would, what we would expect. Unless, I mean, unless this is, if this is higher, then it's what you would expect. You see hydrogen on the, on the higher okay. magnetic field. If it's lower, it's the opposite. <laughs> so That's I don't right. know. Okay, but we don't know if it's higher or lower. We don't know if it's higher or lower. Um, I mean, it, it could be either. The lines look very strange. I mean, these are all very strange. It, it needs it needs more like so. Unfortunately, yesterday was HST's proposal deadline, and I missed it. I wanted to ask for HST for this one too. Uh, next time, <laughs> I'll, I'll ask for next time. For example, a UV spectroscopy can help because if you see the lime and alpha line, lime and alpha is so strong. It's a hydrogen line in the UV. You see it disappearing or like changing. That's that's a much strong. These 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 lines are so weak. Uh, it's hard to see, but they're like extremely weak. Uh, this is another thing. These objects all have very weak lines, which might also be the magnetic field. Yeah, this, this is all new stuff. Uh, yes, good point. That's, that's, that's what we want to do, get more of this and trying to figure out what's the difference in magnetic fields between the two. Also, what's the temperature? This is the same similar temperature that jumps. All of the ones that we have been finding are around the same temperature. So it has something to do with the starting off convection. I'm pretty sure of that because that's the same temperature at which convection starts in helium. So it has to do something with that. Let me see. Let's... Okay. Uh, unless there are other questions, also from Zoom. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Then thank, uh, let's thank Ilaria again.